I'm Pastor and Evangelist Kyle Huckins of Eternity Now, and welcome to the Revelation Bible Study. We're both on Facebook and on YouTube. It's great to have you today with us to be able to study Revelation 14. This week, the famous 144,000 make their appearance. Angels preach the gospel. Christ reaps the earth. Plus our end times event of the week. All in this edition of the Revelation Bible Study, Chapter 14. Every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Mountain, we're live from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska on Facebook.com slash Eternity Now Media. We're also live on YouTube. You can get there by bit.ly slash Eternity Now YouTube. All one word after the slash, capitalize the first letters, also the E, for example. Uh, you can also search for us in under Eternity Now, two words, E-T-E-R-N-I-T-Y-N-O-W. We are the channel with the flaming planet. We have over 100 videos and now about 130 subscribers, up very substantially in the past month. Eternity Now is an evangelism outreach and church that meets Saturdays at 5 p.m. Mountain, 1821 First Avenue in Scotts Bluff. Just go to 19th and Broadway in downtown. Go east or toward the airport a block, and we're right behind Runza. We're the folks with the flaming planet for a sign. You also can see our weekly message on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash Eternity Now Media. Same address as our Revelation Bible study. That's 5.20 p.m. Mountain on Saturday. And no, we are not Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> our group is two years old. We have reached over one million people for Christ in the first two years. We want to do another million this year, this year but we need your help. We just need 50 people giving 50 a month or 100 giving 25 to be able to do this. It's not a great amount of money, a total of $30,000 for ads and everything else, but we need you to come on board, and we're a bit behind. If we're going to make that million, we need you to go to our website at eternitynow.com. Very easy, E-T-E-R-N-I-T-Y-N-O-W dot C-O-M. Click support us. To see more, we have a great video about what we have done, are doing, and going to do, and you can also give securely. Let's go to our Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our time together. Well, Father God, I thank you so much for this period and being able to study your scriptures. You promise a blessing to all who examine Revelation. We know that your promise of forever with you for those who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and live for him is in it on every page. I pray, Lord God, you'll empower me, you'll anoint me, you'll order my thoughts and words here by the power of the Holy Ghost and also have those receive who are going to be watching, listening to this time. We thank you, Lord God, for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. And now our end times event of the week. Always many of these to be able to choose from. The third horseman of the apocalypse, otherwise known as the third of the seven seals, the first round of Revelation's three rounds of judgment, is galloping faster. Revelation 6 says he'll bring scarcity of products and high inflation. Real wages in the USA have fallen for 16 consecutive months due to the rising consumer price index. This is opposed to the 3% annual gain in real wages during the Trump administration. High, major high-end retailers such as Nordstrom's are reporting declining sales. More surprising, however, is the cut in traffic at McDonald's Costco and Dollar Tree, staples for middle and low-income Americans. Credit card companies say that these groups are maxing out their accounts and spending savings as they buy essentials. Meanwhile, meanwhile the U.S. economy shrank 1.6% in the first quarter of this year and six-tenths of 1% on the second, meaning it has met the definition of a recession two straight quarters of declining gross national product. And that comes even as the economy should be growing due to widespread easing of COVID restrictions. Let's go now on to the text of Revelation. And by the way, you might want to have open a window for one of the Bible programs on the internet, such as BibleGateway.com. I am from, going from the New King James Version. Of course, you can also go to chapter 14 of Revelation in your good old print Bible. Got a few of those myself. Now, last week in chapter 13, we had a, a major downer with the midpoint of the tribulation and Antichrist coming to power 
and making all take his mark on pain of death. This week in Revelation 14, we get inspiration as God's people come through the great tribulation and the earth is reaped by Almighty God. The Lord will avenge as well as give strength to his people. The 144,000 are going to be singing their new song and Jesus is going to bless them. Judgment will also begin. And we begin at the beginning of Revelation 14, verse 1. This is the Apostle John writing. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Recall that we saw these folks for the first time in chapter 7. These are Messianic Jews sealed with that father's name written on their foreheads, as opposed to Antichrist's name being written on their foreheads or in their right hand for those who can never then be saved. Now, these Messianic Jews are in the great tribulation at this point, and they are united with our Lord. That lamb has a capital L because that's Jesus. <laughs> and keep we have to remember from this, keep hanging on. Yes, times seem difficult, but my goodness, they're going to be so much worse after the tribulation, uh, or after the rapture and in the tribulation also, for those who don't accept Christ, after the tribulation, when they are judged by the Lamb, or in the great white throne judgment. But we who are in Christ need to look to the author and finisher of our faith now all the more, because this is close to the end. We may be within seconds, even hours, even days, of going up with our Lord Jesus. We're going to be called from heaven with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. And we are going to meet Jesus in the air as well as each other. The dead coming first, and they're going to be raised to life. And then all of us who are alive get those resurrection bodies that shall never perish, wear out, grow old, all the rest of it. And then we will ever be with the Lord as well as that great company of faithful witnesses cheering us on throughout all time. It's just days away. Do you really want to have seven more years of something even far worse than this that we see now in America and around the world? I don't think so. There are so many people who are young. I think I saw four or five people today who are under 40 years old who are famous and just died, performers and all the rest of it. My guess is there might be one or two from COVID-related jab problems, but probably a number are committing suicide. Friends, we have never seen such a high suicide rate among young people as we have now. There always was the elderly as a category, those who had the highest suicide rate. Obviously, you know, many are in pain. They have the difficulties of uh, elderly, uh, complications, health problems. But we actually have people who are 18 to 24 above average in suicide. This is very, very sad. I was a college professor for over 20 years. It's very, very sad. These people have their lives to look forward to, but they are not looking forward to it because they don't know Jesus. Share this broadcast. Share our messages with young people. They will give them hope of eternity with Christ. We go to Revelation 14, verses 2 and 3. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harp. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. We know from Revelation 4 and 5 that the elders are in God's throne room, as are the four living creatures guarding our almighty Lord. This passage, by the way, is the origin of the belief that there are many who are playing harps in heaven. Uh, the new song is from God. He's a fantastic com composer. It likely is of love toward his chosen people, the original ones, the Jews. We Gentiles then get grafted in, but the chosen people have now seen and received their Messiah, and they have come home to him in Christ. Oh, I tell you, the Apostle Paul is going to be just bounding about uh, in heaven. He is going to be so excited to be able to see all of those brethren with him. Now here, Jesus is still in heaven, but he is united in spirit with the 144,000 on earth. The tribulation is still going on. 
Some people like the Jehovah's Witnesses, which unfortunately is a cult. It does not believe that Jesus is God. Uh, they say that only 144,000 have the choice seats for eternity. Absolutely false. There is going to be such a company no one can number, it says in Revelation 7. And those are only the ones who were martyred and came out of the tribulation. How about all of the billions who have followed Christ throughout the eons? There are over 2 billion people on the face of the earth today who call themselves Christian, even if only a half of them are saved. <laughs> have you ever tried to count a billion from one, two, three? That's going to be pretty hard to number. Now, some believe that these sealed Jews have been killed and are in the throne room literally, while others say that they are alive right here on the earth. And I tend to go with the latter, that they are yet alive down here on Guilty Sod. Why is this? Well, Mount Zion is mentioned. This is a real place on the face of the earth. If the 144,000 were dead on earth, but alive in heaven, why would they be there? Also, John says, the apostle John, our author, that the father's voice thunders. And this usually is an indication of hearing him on earth. Remember, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. I tell you, if, if I'm hearing that one, I'm, I'm getting a little bit of a goosebump on me. Uh, uh, when God speaks, people better listen. Revelation 14 verses 4 and 5 say, These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they're without fault before the throne of God. Now, we have some fairly unbiblical beliefs about sex and marriage in the church in the United States. Uh, we used to be even a little more obsessed with natural family back in the 80s and 90s, but really, the Bible is not big on natural family. It's wonderful when you have a husband and wife, and they have children, and they pass faith down to them. But it's not automatic. We have an individual relationship with God, and not through our parents. We have to have it with God, the Father, through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. These men here are pure, not having had sex, but channeling those passions into their witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the early church, most pastors and other officials were unmarried. It was seen as far better, and this is also in the Bible. The Apostle Paul explains why in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 to 34. I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And a lot of them aren't too concerned about that these days. Unfortunately, the modern American church often pushes pastors and others to be married, but it should not. Now, I haven't been married, and the Lord has allowed me three careers of 20 years or more in which I've been able to witness of him. Professional media and news, higher education, and ministry. Unfortunately, I've lived and served long enough in those to see all three of them go bad substantially. However, we persevere by God's power. It's very likely I could have done all that while married and maintained good relationships with my wife and children. But that said, I've been able to successfully counsel those married as well as singles, even be able to work with youth well, because it's all about relationship, communication, respect, love. That's really what it's all about. So if you have someone applying for the pastor of your church, or you hear somebody who is single, who is preaching, give them apt attention just like you would anyone else. In fact, listen a little harder because they have less to cloud their mind. I can testify that way. 
God has sent me into some really difficult places. Yeah, there are a lot of those right here in America. Not everybody in the churches of God, my friends. And so I've been able to do that and see people saved in those places where if somebody who is married went in, they would probably be cowed a little bit to back off some of the tougher things of God and challenging the people. I have a feeling that this happens quite a bit around the country today. And this is why people are lax in observing the commandments of God. People do not have a God-first mentality. They have a world-first mentality, and then they try to sneak God into that. It's not going to work. He's Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. The 144,000 are single-minded in their devotion to Christ, and they follow him wherever he leads, as all of us ought to be doing right now. They're also the first fruits of Israel coming to faith during the tribulation. Remember, the redemption of the chosen people, the Jews, is the main reason for the seven years, week of years of the tribulation, especially the second half. The great tribulation when Antichrist is reigning, uh, he is killing everybody left and right who will not worship him. People are cut off from buying and selling food and water and all the rest if they will not take the mark. And so that concluding of Daniel's 70th week of years is going to be basically hell on earth. But boy, better to be in hell on earth and be saved and maybe be a martyr for it than it is to live well and to go to hell forever. Because from hell, there is no rescue. You're not going. The door is locked from the outside, and no matter how much you beat on it, it's not gonna open. That's your sentence forever. Verses 6 and 7 of Revelation 14 say, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Water is a sign of life. Where do demons go? They roam through waterless, dry places, seeking a victim with water so they can live out their horrible thoughts and plans. The gospel of salvation through Christ right here is yet being preached. But this angel says it's coming to a close. Judgment is about to arrive in its full form. Remember when Jesus Christ shows up, Everybody who is alive is separated into sheep and goats. Sheep are the ones who have accepted Christ in the tribulation. Of course, all of us beforehand have been raptured and we got to miss it. Thank God. That's one event I don't want to be part of is the tribulation. But then those on earth who've kept his word and given their lives to him, they will rule and reign with him forever. And they will also get those resurrection bodies, finally, that don't wear out, fade, grow old. The rest of the folks who survived the tribulation but didn't have Christ, they're the goats and they go straight to hell. Wouldn't that be awful to come through the tribulation alive? There's not going to be very many killed. We know half of earth will die in the first half. And that's not even counting what's going to happen when the bull judgments hit and uh, the entire sea network, all of the seas of the earth, uh, have everything in them killed, for example. Uh, We have different kinds of heavenly bodies hitting the earth and the rest of it. Obviously, billions more are going to die. There's going to be maybe a billion left if we're lucky, you know, or blessed. Let's not say lucky, let's say blessed. And then so many people go to hell. Oh, boy. 
consider that these people are going to be under so much pressure in the second half of the tribulation. They've already have lost several billion people in war. They have faced starvation. They have had continual unrest in the streets, and they have had the rise of the most brutal leader of all time. Yes, worse than Mao. Yes, worse than Stalin. The rise of Antichrist. <clears throat> now, if they aren't saved now, then how is that going to happen? Well, you know, all the calamity has been foretold. Most alive at that time likely will have heard the gospel before the tribulation, and now the angels will make sure they hear it during the tribulation too. Revelation 14, verses 8 to 11. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. <clears throat> now, excuse me. Babylon, when it's not used literally for the Middle East, Eastern city, there actually was a city of Babylon, a kingdom centered from there, which would be in modern Iraq. Or it doesn't refer to the biblical kingdom or the city. It stands for the fallen world system. We see that final system is forming now. It is an unlikely combination of big business, big tech, big media, and big government all coming together and cooperating. We just heard how Facebook's head, Zuckerberg, said that Facebook purposefully censored the story about Hunter Biden, very key in the, in the waning days of the 2020 election. Many people, many observers from both sides of the aisle feel that the election would have gone a different way had that been played right down the middle as true journalism and a true journalist for the third of a century had been used in that situation. The angels here are yet warning the people, don't give in to the devil and take the mark. It is going to be hell forever if you do. What happened? I have noticed in studying Revelation is that God is moving from a faith-only system, like it, we have this faith and then sometimes we have some decisions to exercise it that are particularly purposeful. He's trying to make it really easy. Okay, if you have that physical mark on you, then whoever's physical mark you have, you are following. That is, if you have the devil's mark, you're of the devil. Okay, so you want to be with Christ, don't take the mark. If you don't want to be with Christ and you want to have a full belly, but a hellish eternity, well, then get the mark by all means. But don't think that you're going to be spared or forgiven because you are making a final decision at that point. He's actually making it easy for us. People say they have trouble understanding spiritual things, really, then they have trouble understanding the world because the spiritual controls the physical. Who made planet Earth? Who made the moon? Who made the seas? Take a look at Job when God shows up in the 38th chapter with him after he's been saying, boy, he's, God, he's, he's tough on me. I wish I could be able to present my case. He never presented his case because he was scared almost to death when the almighty Yahweh came out there out of the whirlwind. And he said, where were you when I made the gates of the sea? Where were you when I put the treasuries of snow in heaven? Where were you? Answer me if you would like. God judges, my friend. He's not just all uh, fun and uh, a bed of roses. No, no, no. In fact, on the earth, you're likely not going to get a bed of roses when you get saved. But you will get wonderful roses for eternity, and you will have a better life now. You won't have sexually transmitted diseases. You will not have a hopeless 
time of convalescence. You will be able to have the joy of Jesus every day, and that is worth the exchange every time, my friend, every time. God is beginning to draw us out of the world system right now. We have businesses here in so-called Christian nation, America, discriminating against born-again Christians or anybody who takes that faith seriously, who's made a commitment to Christ and follows the Bible. And when we have businesses, the world wants to force us to hire lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and transgender folks, even though they are against what we stand for. Friends, having a private business or being able to be in a religious nonprofit means I don't have to support people who despise what I believe in. That's freedom of religion as well as freedom of speech and freedom of association, which has been upheld innumerable times by the United States Supreme Court. COVID in many places has been an excuse to persecute churches. By the way, it's even worse in Canada. I love the fact that that Polish pastor who was arrested in Calgary, he had a half a dozen of the Canadian Gestapo trying to storm his church without warning and without warrants right before a service. And he said, get out of here, you Nazis. My family fought against them in Poland. Yeah, they arrested him, but he's been freed. Praise God. Uh, the Lord God will give us strength as we go through this and we're faithful to him. The oppression has been far more extreme than in North America when we look at China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. But the United States of America is bowing to each one of these. Oh yeah, we, we've got a little window dressing with a little warship going through neutral waters between Taiwan and mainland China, but China is flouting our restrictions and embargoes on Venezuela as well as Iran, and we say nothing about it. They're just openly on radar for everybody to be able to see. What do we do? Absolutely nothing. General Milley is just twiddling his little thumbs trying to get us to be more woke and to make our armed forces more divided. We need to realize the Bible endorses peace through strength. It doesn't say get rid of all your armies and you know just trust God that way. There are basic kinds of actions we need to take to protect the innocent. When you get rid of your army, you say to your kids, well, you know, hey, maybe we're all going to get slaughtered by our folks next door who hate us, but hey, it's going to be all right. That's, that's not responsible, friends. That's not responsible at all. And you know what happens when the United States goes down? Who's going to defend freedom in the world? We're a pretty poor example of freedom right now because of some of the recent changes at the top. But who is going to step in? Do, do you think that Belgium is going to free and liberate the world like we did Western Europe back in the 1940s and 50s? Uh, do you think that Swaziland is going to come forward all of a sudden and supply a million man army? Uh, do you believe that uh, Peru is going to take all of its guinea pigs and, free the, and feed the world? No, it's not going to happen. America's going down, and that means the free world is going down. Think before you vote. Revelation 14, verses 12 and 13. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Holy Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Those coming to faith in the tribulation still need to follow Christ. There never has been this easy believism. I believe that there's a Jesus and he's almighty, so that saves me. That's never saved you. Most everyone who has heard about Jesus has believed in him. There's not very many people who don't think that there was a Jesus anywhere. Even now, it's not really a big question as far as in theology, uh, when considering even the liberal ones. But it's whether you follow that man from Galilee, you follow his father, you have his spirit, and the spirit leads you. If you are not led by the spirit of God, then you are none of his. That's what Romans 8 says. So we need to follow now, and we need to follow later. In the great tribulation, my friend, to die may well be the greatest blessing you can have. Remember how in Revelation 9, 
we saw that demonic locusts from the pit of hell are going to be released and sting the unsaved for five months so badly they want to die. But God will not give them release. They despise the Lord. There will be no stings, by the way, of those who are saved. They are sealed to God from this punishment, just like back in the days of Pharaoh, Egypt, and Moses and Israel. There is not going to be any evading of Antichrist and the false prophet, even for God's people, in the tribulation. I I have been recently reminded just how much that God does for us that we are unaware of. Think of all the horrible circumstances that we could be in as saved people that we have been delivered from. Once in a while, we get a sense that, oh, that could have been a horrible business deal, or my goodness, I could have gone over the edge of that cliff and the rest of it. But not too often. I'll tell you, there are so many things I have been involved in through the years. I could have been dead a DOA dead on arrival in a hospital. I could have been uh, bankrupt. I could have been, <laughs> but but for God. I have had a lot of hard times, a lot of difficulty and discrimination, but I'll tell you what, I wouldn't trade nothing from a journey now, as uh, the Happy Goodman's old gospel song says. Death in the tribulation will mean no more being hunted, trying to find something to eat, searching for a place to buy and sell. It will mean rest with the Lord. But friend, don't take that way out now. Way too many people, as I mentioned before, are doing that. I have even known some Christians, people who seemed to have good theology, and they took their own lives. Friends, I'm not going to automatically put them in hell. God is the ultimate judge. But I'm going to say, we get the idea, if someone destroys the temple of God, the Lord in his holy word says, him I will destroy. So it's not good. It's not a good witness. It's not good for our soul. And it puts us into some jeopardy, right? We need to wait until God takes us out. God will take us out in time that we will be able to be a good witness all the way home. Why would he not? Why would he call us, have us saved, and then have us recant our faith when we're about to die? No. We need to love him first. He'll get us home. He can hide us in the secret place. He can help us to be in heaven spiritually while our body is dying. Stick with God. Claim him forever. God will do it. Revelation 14, verses 14 to 16. Again, the Apostle John writing, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Mm. I love how that is written. You never hear about it, but I love that. This is Jesus. He's one like the Son of Man. That's one of his descriptions in the Gospels as well. In fact, he considered it more amazing that he was a son of man than a son of God. God started that whole process with Adam and Eve, whereby all of us came about, right? So in a sense, we have God as a father removed until we're saved, but only one man was conceived of God by the Holy Spirit. And that's the Christ, the son of the living God. So Jesus is in heaven. He's waiting for his angels to say that there have been enough chances to repent. Then it is the hour of final judgment of the earth. We're going to reap the earth. It's been, its judgment has been delayed. I keep saying to the Lord, is it about time for it to happen? He says, it's way past time. He's been gracious. He's been forgiving. He has allowed people to come to him and to hear the gospel Uh, It's amazing how God can bring people out even in tiny towns as well as in major cities that he can give us efficiencies as we place ads on social media to get the gospel before people. But it's going to end really, really soon in stages. First, the church is taken out of the way in the rapture, making it amazingly harder to be saved. Can you imagine being saved and having virtually no support group anywhere in the world? Okay, 
then we're going to have the great tribulation. You're going to have Antichrist. If you sign up with God, you are on the enemy's hit list, literally, with Antichrist, because he's the devil's Christ as opposed to God's Christ, Jesus. And then, of course, at the end is the judgment. A sickle, by the way, is a crescent-shaped sharp blade, kind of a half circle, with a long handle that's used to cut vines and grains that are long and tough. The most famous example that modern people would be aware of is on the Russian flag. There's a hammer and sickle. Why is that? It represents workers. The sickle is those who work in the fields. The hammer would be those who work in factories or on machinery. Note that it also looks similar to a shepherd's staff with that long pole and the hook-like end, but the sickle is a bit different. It has razor-sharp edges. You would not use this with a sheep unless you wanted it to die really quickly. Jesus has tried to save people for 2,000 years. You cannot give more than he did. Being mistaken, uh, for an enemy by the very people leading his temple, falsely accused, constantly, willfully misunderstood, people blaspheming the Holy Spirit who say that they are of him, and all the rest of it dying brutally at the hands of one of the most brutal regimes in history, Rome, as well as the uh, folks who were the legalistic, as well as the annihilistic folks of the temple. Then we've waited for 70 generations almost, We've been able to get in with our faith and then following those steps. But finally, there's a day that that comes to an end and that's coming pretty fast. These folks, most of them are going to reap what they have sown, which is hell. Galatians 6 verifies, and it was the origin for, the saying, what goes around comes around. If you live hellishly, if you treat people hellishly, and you give no regard to anything but the world, which is hell ultimately, and going to hell, then you'll be in hell. There's not some kind of magic potion or spell that somebody's going to say gets you out of that. And by the way, if you have lived for Christ, followed Christ, suffered for Christ, and you have told people about Christ and done what the Lord would have you to do, you're going to be in heaven. There's no two ways about it. I don't care if you call yourself Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Word of Faith Pentecostal, or Independent Fundamental King James Only Baptist. You will be with the Lord forever, okay? Period and end of report. This isn't that difficult, okay? And remember, my friends, if you just think that faith saves you, faith has works. What you do every day testifies of the Lord for good or for ill. And if you say that you're of God and you do the things of the devil, you're not of God and you're testifying of the devil. Now, once in a while, we, we all make mistakes. We have our problems, especially as we're getting going. It, you know, Grace is definitely great for those who are saved. But don't fool yourself that you can go Sunday morning or in our case, Saturday afternoon to church and do hell all the rest of the week and you're saved. No. You're not. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That means to press into the kingdom of God. When you have trouble keeping the commandments, you pray to God. And you say, God, help me to be patient. Help me to be kind. Help me to be forgiving. I know I'm not there all the way. I do that myself. I'm not perfect. I'm not Jesus. <laughs> you know, I have a spirit, but I'm sure not perfect. And I'm in an imperfect world, for goodness sakes. So are you. So we've got to press in, we've got to ask God for help, friends, no matter who we are, whether we're Reverend Kyle Huckins, PhD, or just plain old Kyle, we've got to do it. And Revelation 14, verses 17 to 20. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress, up to the horse's bridles for 16 
hundred furlongs. We'll tell you how long that is in a moment. This scene is a little difficult. It appears to be heavenly, except for the blood. There's not a lot of blood in heaven. You know, people are not like on earth. They are not shooting each other and cutting each other and all the rest. The city seems here to be Babylon, which would be a metaphor for the corrupt world system. That is essentially the only use of Babylon in Revelation. Now, there are other ones, of course, especially in the Old Testament, which would be literal Babylon, the city or the kingdom, but not uh, we're talking about here in Revelation. This is foreshadowing of what is to come physically with the bold judgments of Revelation 16, which are so great and so very terrible. In that very chapter, which we'll study in a couple of weeks, there will be sores given to people, scorching heat, much more, including blood in all of the earth's waters. Many also will be killed in the Battle of Armageddon. And this passage could describe that overall carnage. I would say that's probably the odds on favorite. Some see this as taking place outside Jerusalem, perhaps, during the Battle of Armageddon. Armageddon, uh, the plain of Megiddo and the hill of Megiddo are a ways away out in the country, by the way, from Jerusalem. The blood that would be spilled in that conflict, remember I was telling you how much 1,600 furlongs would be, 184 miles is how long it is gonna run. Now, if you have canals and such, then it certainly can go that far. How long is 184 miles? Okay, it would take about three hours per car. It would be, in my context, Scottsbluff, Nebraska to North Platte. It would be Amarillo to Roswell, New Mexico. For those out east, Baltimore to New York City. Wow. Recall again, Revelation 9, we had 200 million horsemen coming across the Euphrates with Christ in the lead. He's going to be the one, he says, who will save the fallen world. No, he's going to be knocked from his horse and disintegrated by the brightness of Jesus coming. Take a look at that in 2 Thessalonians 2. I want to see that one. If there are forces from China and Russia and India there at the time of Armageddon, and the slaughter is tremendous, as we believe Isaiah talks of this as well, there certainly will be plenty of blood. Think of the blood 200 million people. My goodness, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? Now, looking at the Greek of this passage, 1420, Revelation 1420, we see that the blood just goes out from the wine trough as high as the horse's bridles. If you have not been uh, on a horse, you were not from the Great Plains or Mountain West, that would be about four to five feet high of blood. That's amazing. That would likely be a maximum and not necessarily a consistent height. It would go out at that height, but then the rest of it, it could be a splattering that high rather than having it consistently to that depth. We simply don't know. And if there are that many millions of people, there certainly could be places too where the blood could be that deep. Maybe there's a pool or uh, there's an indentation in the earth. Uh, just like in the Great Flood, there were places where the mud was far deeper in some places than others. So uh, we will uh, have to wait for that. Remember that we who are saved are going to be coming out of heaven behind Jesus Christ with a white horse. Think that animals don't go to heaven? Jesus is on a white horse when he comes out of it. Take a look at Revelation 17. Then we are going to be able to follow him and we are going to be able to see him prevail over all these. Millions. These people who struck him on the earth, he wasn't able to fight back. He let all righteousness be perfected, but they are now going to be bowing with a rod of iron. You know, it is loving to judge. If we don't judge, then we let child molesters on our children with doing nothing. Okay, We let people like Hitler get away with literal murder and genocide of the Jews and other people too, like the Poles. Like the homosexuals, we don't approve what the gays do, but we don't want to slaughter them wholesale. We want them to get saved. God can overcome that. Love judges. Love is forgiving, but love also judges when people will not repent. And this is about to happen, my friend. I can feel more and more of this in the heart of God. It's like you have this wonderful sympathy and empathy for people who are 
flailing about in life. They don't know what they're doing. But at some point, you've testified so much that you've given the tracks, you've sent the videos, all the rest of it, and they just won't change. And in fact, they even brutally hate and try to misuse you like they did Jesus. If they do it to the master, how much more they do it to the servant is what our Lord Jesus himself said in his early ministry. Coming to that time for the end of that. So to summarize, this chapter shows God's plan beginning to come to fruition. 144,000 are with Christ triumphantly on Mount Zion. The gospel goes out as well as a warning. The final judgment is and not to take the mark of the beast or worship him. You will not be forgiven the mark of the beast, period. That's what the Bible says. The only unforgivable sin, Jesus says, is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, the mark of the beast is a form of that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It is saying that the enemy, the devil, is the creator, and I belong to him, and I will subsist on him. But what he is is the author of death. Jesus Christ, his Father, and his Spirit are the authors of life. Angels work with Jesus as the evils of earth become ready for reaping in judgment. The grapes, the Greek text indicates, are actually overripe. God has waited as long as possible, delaying and delaying and delaying so people can come in. And people have. We have seen people save dozens on the ground, more online. It's fantastic to see people still coming to the Lord. Christ, from his heavenly vantage point, thrusts in that sharp sickle to cut the vines and bring in the worldly harvest of the grapes of wrath. He would have preferred to use a shepherd's staff every single time, but you would not, as he said to Jerusalem. Oh, I would have gathered you under me as a hen gathers its chicks, but you would not, you would not, oh Jerusalem, you would not. The unsaved wouldn't repent. The grapes are trampled in a wine trough, just like that famous line in the Battle Hymn of the Republic, one of the greatest hits of the Civil War, but people still sing it today. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. The wine is, in reality, blood, which goes out up to four to five feet high for over 180 miles, Baltimore to D.C. This may be a measure, or I'm sorry, Baltimore to New York City. This may be a measure of the overall carnage from the final judgment of earth or the actual measure of blood from the Battle of Armageddon. So lessons for us were that no matter how long the odds seem, God is going to win and the devil is going to lose. And right now, the world seems to have no use for the Lord, but he will judge it and his son will rule and reign over it very shortly, probably in a short number of years. Number two, the gospel is still proclaimed at the end of the Great Tribulation. We have no excuse for failing to tell people about it now. Make sure your family, friends, and neighbors are saved, or at least they have heard the way of salvation. My friend, write to us, telephone me, text me, email me, eternitynow.com, K-H-U-C-K-I-N-S at eternitynow.com, or info at eternitynow.com. I'll eventually get it. Call or text 806-463-8793, USA, 1-806-463-8793. We will send you as many tracks as you want. We will send you Gospels of Mark as much as you want. We will send you our cards which have the way of salvation on the back of a standard business card, as many as you want of those. This is important. This, this is vital. This is life and death. Life and death eternally. Death on earth comes in a relatively short period of time. But death eternally never ends. Friends, if you truly believe that those who don't know Christ are lost forever, act on it. Do the Great Commission. You don't have to be a preacher like me to obey the Great Commission. And I was doing that, testifying and leading people to Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, from two years into my faith 26 years ago. God, yes, has given me the gift of evangelism, but he has done it so I can tell you and teach you how to be an evangelist yourself. You don't have to be real articulate. You don't have to be real outgoing. Just use our card, believe in Christ, pray, and he will do it. Number three, far from being a removed God, unapproachable in heaven, the Lord and his angels are watching earth every moment, ready to put in the sharp sickle of judgment. My friend, do you think that they are going to spare the line manipulating folks? 
playing the hypocrite of the harlot with false accusations and thinly disguised hatreds in church as well as in the world? I think not. And the ones in the church will be lower than the ones in the world. Number four, those who have no use for God and fight him will lose on earth and in the life to come. Double loss. This chapter speaks of blood up to five feet high at times going out to a length of over 180 miles. Four billion or more have already been killed at this point in the tribulation. So if you don't know the Lord, don't kid yourself that you're going to escape the carnage and final judgment. You will not. Two places to go, heaven or hell. If you don't accept Christ, you're going to hell. It's not me saying it. It is the Bible. It's extremely clear. Extremely clear. Jesus Christ himself talks far more about hell than heaven because we need to have the fear of God put into us. There is a holy God that is perfect. You and I aren't even close. Even if you're Mother Teresa, you're not even close. I'm not even close. Okay? 28 years saved. I'm still imperfect. I just told you how I have to repent and ask God for help to be able to uh, be according to his commandments. We keep pressing in all our lives. But if you're not even trying, if you don't even believe in God, you're, you're lost. You're lost. But you can be saved right now. There are just four essentials to salvation. People make it all kinds of complicated. That's man. God makes it simple. Number one, repent, turn from sin, ask God's forgiveness. I've done it. Every saved believer has done it. Everyone but Jesus who will be in heaven has done it uh, as far as people. Number two, confess faith in Jesus Christ. You're not going to get in on your good works. You might get some rewards for it if you're saved, but you're strictly judged on whether you have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you followed him on the earth. Now, I don't well you followed him, but at least you tried to follow him, Okay. Confess faith in Jesus Christ when somebody asks you who your faith is in and show it every day. Tell it to other people. Believe also Jesus Christ rose in body and spirit the third day from the tomb. We need to have this body, this tent resurrected. We also need to have our spirit resurrected. And so his had to be as well. And follow our Lord as Lord and Savior. That means we do and we to do what he says. We aren't going to be perfect, and he absolutely knows that. He knows that better than anybody. And I'll tell you, he has infinite grace and mercy for you. He said to Peter, who thought he was really being spiritual, hey, Lord, do I have to forgive some, my brother seven, time, seven times if he sins against me? The, the teaching of the rabbis at the time was three times. So he thought, oh, seven's going to get me an A. Now, Jesus said 70 times seven. 490. And that's a way of saying infinite. Okay. As long as the person is genuine and trying to get it right, you forgive them. And that's the same as Christ with us. Do you think he'd be doing less than that? No, of course not. He'd be doing more. But he's also going to be your judge. And there's going to be a day there's no more mercy. Okay, This is mercy right now. That you can accept it no matter what kind of life you've had, no matter how you have treated the people God and all that stuff, you can be saved. No, when you are before him, it's over. Your fate is settled. So you better do it now. I'm going to lead you in a prayer to be able to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is not the whole salvation, but it's going to begin that process. Repeat after me if you believe what I'm saying. And then just press on into God. I'll give you quickly some steps of discipleship, and you will be able to be in heaven. Father God, I repent of my sins. Please forgive me. I confess faith in Jesus Christ that he died for my sins. I believe he rose in body and spirit the third day in the tomb. I will follow him as Lord and Savior, repenting should I fall. Come into my heart, Lord God, and save me in Jesus' name. Amen. So be it and it is. <laughs> Every journey begins with that single step. And my friend, once we're saved, we need to be baptized in water. Jesus did it as an example to us. 
that we would make a public profession of him. We also need to read the Bible. This is how we find out who God is. I got saved basically by reading a little old Gideon pocket New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. That was it. That's the power of the word. And it tells you what you can have in that kingdom of God. Love, power, and sound mind. We pray to receive those things if we don't have them. And we also join with someone else if we have that power magnified, and especially if we need unity, other people, to have what we're praying for. We go to church. Please join us in person if you can at 1821 First Avenue in downtown Scotts Bluff, 19th and Broadway. Go there to that intersection downtown. Go east at Runza, one block, and we're the folks with the flaming planet for the sign. Eternity Now. Also join us at eternitynow.com and go to all of our different social media you can have and all the videos. And you can also watch uh, and worship with us live on Facebook at 5.20 p.m. Mountain on Saturdays. And we're going to have some exciting times uh, this Saturday to be able to preach. And then also this broadcast Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Mountain, here on Facebook.com slash Eternity Now Media. That's our Facebook page. Facebook.com slash Eternity Now Media. After the slash all one word, no dots or dashes. <clears throat> Make sure to go to our website, EternityNow.com, and all the rest. Fellowship, too, with other believers. At church, you're going to be able to get prayer. You're going to be able to see folks. You know, you're going to be able to have some encouragement and make connections to be able to help others as well as yourself get through this Christian life. Then fellowship with other believers outside of the four walls of the sanctuary. Friends, if we keep everything inside the sanctuary, there is no testimony of Jesus Christ to the people who need it the most. Outside the sanctuary, the folks who aren't coming, who don't regard him. We also need to get to know each other. Friends, we're supposed to be storming the gates of hell. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 16, 18, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. The warring, the folks who were on the war path would storm gates. They would try to bring them down, push them in to be able to take a city. That's what we want to do in snatching those souls out of the fire that are now with Satan. We finally pursue personal relationship with the only God that ever was, is, and will be. Yahweh in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. He knit your soul together and put it into your body. He started the process physically whereby you could be begotten by your mother and father. He knows every last thing about you, every cell, every hair on your head, as it says in Matthew 6. He also knows every sin you've committed and also every good work you've done in his spirit. Get to know him like he knows you. That's the ultimate relationship, is it not? As we get close to the end here, remember, a Revelation Bible study from Eternity Now, every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Mountain, live from Scottsbluff, Nebraska, in the middle of the country to reach all the world. www.facebook.com slash Eternity Now Media. We are live and direct then, as well as on Saturday afternoons, 5 20 p.m. Mountain with our worship service, prayer, and announcements. We pray for you in that time. If you want to be prayed for, you just email me, uh, send something to us on our page on Messenger, whatever you need to do, text me, 806-463-8793, and we will pray for it. Eternity Now is an evangelism outreach and church that meets Saturdays, 5 p.m. Mountain, 1821 First Avenue in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Our group is two years old. First two years, we reached 1,047,514 people for Christ. We want to do another million this year, but we're behind. We need your help. We need 50 people giving 50 a month or 100 donating $25 a month. This isn't for us. This is to get out the gospel to people. It costs money to be able to produce videos, to be able to get them before people on social media and the internet. We need to have your help. Do you know what, if you do the math, that totals $30,000. You think I'm getting rich on 30 grand? Do you think that anybody can get rich on 30 grand anymore? <laughs> Which is worth about 3,000 as it was a generation ago. No, but we need your help. We can't do it alone. Go to our website at www.eternitynow.com, E-T-E-R-N-I-T-Y, N-O-W dot C-O-M. Click support us, eternitynow.com. Click support us to see more and to give securely. We have a video there that shows what we have done, we are doing, and we're going to do. You may also mail us a check. Yes, some people still write those. Make it out to Eternity Now, two words. 
P.O. Box 1422, P.O. Box 1422, Scott's Bluff. That's one word, S-C-O-T-T-S-B-L-U-F-F-N-E for Nebraska, USA 69363. Again, Eternity Now, P.O. Box 1422, Scott's Bluff, Nebraska, N-E, USA 69363. And that is tax deductible. We are 501c3. Let's pray here at the end for you. Oh, Lord God, we thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for the Holy Spirit to do this. Thank you for drawing people. Thank you for having the application of the word to these people's hearts. Father God, help them in the areas of life in which they have difficulty. Help them to keep your commandments. Help them to have the peace that surpasses all understanding, God, in their heart and mind of Christ Jesus, having made the request known to you. Bring home the wayward children, wayward family members. Help us to reach out to our neighbors, our co-workers, our bosses, our employees. Uh, give us opportunities to share the gospel with people in spirit and in truth. Uh, Father God, help us to be wise and discerning as well as powerful in the spirit, mighty in God. Father God, to the pulling down of strongholds that block people from coming into your kingdom, both as eternity now and individually all across this world. We also pray for every faithful assembly on the face of the earth that is seeking to make Jesus Christ known in hearts and lives, salvation and sanctification and discipleship and the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. I pray, Lord God, for uh, helps and miracles of finance, of provision, of fellowship, of peace in homes, of, Father God, peace in hearts for those who are watching, listening today. Lord God, we thank you for each one. Bless them mightily in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Reverend Kyle Huggins, PhD, Pastor Kyle, from here at Eternity Now, Pastor and Evangelist, we will see you Saturday, 520 p.m. Mountain, Facebook.com slash Eternity Now Media, and then next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Mountain, right here again, Facebook.com slash Eternity Now Media, Revelation 15. Go with God, for he desires to walk with you. Yeah.